smartest city, the smartest people, the biggest idea. Last year, last year at Idea City 03, we heard the wrenching story of the Rwandan genocide from Romeo Dallaire. He described, and uh, many people will never forget it, he described the eerie, almost uh, slow motion descent into that madness while he was essentially forced to watch from the sideline sidelined as he was by a bureaucratic and apparently in different United Nations. In other words, he described a failure in peacekeeping. This year we have with us General Lewis McKenzie, whose successful operations in Sarajevo demonstrated an all too rare success for the same peacekeeping, which Canadians like to tell themselves is a character of ours, a generous character of our nature, and defines the point and purpose of our defense forces. But we do know there's a huge gap between the actual capabilities of our soldiers and the idealistic missions for which they are meant to serve. And that's the reality that practical idealists like General McKenzie have to grapple with all the time. The scarcity of resources, the endless hypocrisy of politicians, and the human limits of the men and women who are called upon to do the job. Lewis? Thank you. Thank you. This could be difficult. I haven't had a large meal in a long time. This time of day, you might wonder what the hell that has to do with the presentation. Uh, some of you know uh, and remember Pavlov's dog, condition reflex. Pavlov fed the dog for two weeks. Every time he fed him, he rang a bell. Two weeks and a day later, he rang the bell, didn't feed the dog, dog drooled anyway. It's called a condition reflex. The first 39 nights after I arrived back in Canada from Sarajevo in New York, I was invited to speak for my dinner. And on 20 of those days, I spoke for my lunch. On the 40th, night back, I wasn't invited to speak for my dinner, and I took my wife to McDonald's over on Young Street, and halfway through, a Big Mac stood up and gave an unsolicited presentation. <laughs> her. No, I made that up. I made that up about five years ago to lighten up an audience in this city, and wouldn't you know, there was a reporter there from the Globe and Mail who reported it as fact. <laughs> And so I'm normally introduced, not as a retired Major General, but the retarded Major General that goes around to McDonald's. <laughs> I'm going to pick a most unusual subject this morning for my 20 minutes. Canada. And actually say some very positive things. Now, I know this is unusual. It's unpopular. Uh, for, for four years, we were voted by the UN, 191 member nations, as the best country in which to live, and the first thing we did when we heard about it was apologize. <laughs> oh my God, you haven't been on the Don Valley Parkway on a Friday night. You, know, you, can't mean, you can't mean Canada, you know. Six years ago, Japan was number one, we were number two, and then it switched around. We became number one, they became number two, and the Canadian said to me, watch those Japanese, they stole our second place. <laughs> No, it's true. It's true. We're so comfortable now. I think we're down around five or six. I mean, this is heaven, thank God. Because it eliminates some responsibility. Because complacency is a national sport in this country. I have watched this country for half of my life from abroad. And we have turned complacency into just that, a national sport. And it was so bad that it actually enticed me for one brief moment to get involved in politics. The worst night of my life, <laughs> bar none, bar none, including all the horror of Sarajevo, was the night of the last Quebec referendum. Whoever that idiot was that put a bar graph on the bottom of the screen that moved back and forth between 49, 50, 51 percent, my country's okay, my country's gone. My country's okay, my country's gone, should be shot. With all its warts, 
The Canadian military represents the very best in synergy between French and English. And I told audiences the story that in about the third day of the airlift in Sarajevo, we're bringing in 300 tons of food and medicine every day. We were providing that to the Bosnian Muslims, and please don't be offended by my use of two ter uh, three terms, uh, ethnic, ethnic, religion. Serb, Muslim, Croat. Two ethnic, one religion, because that's how they asked us to refer to them, the three side. But there were some Serbian areas that were blockaded also. So on the fourth day, I wanted to get some humanitarian aid in there also, because we're a UN force. We're objective. We're impartial. On the way in, this humanitarian aid was surrounded by the Bosnian Muslim army, and 26 Canadian soldiers were told that they were going to be killed and burnt to death. Now, just by chance, I had the reverse of the NRG, the National Representative Group in Sarajevo. The battalion of Canadians that I had there that I borrowed for a month were two-thirds francophone, one-third anglophone. The anglophones were the ones, the soldiers from the Royal Canadian Regiment, that were captured. They were accused of smuggling arms and ammunition to the Serbs, which was BS. It was all humanitarian aid. And so I went down to the presidency and saw President Itzabegovic of Bosnia and explained to the president that this was ridiculous. This is humanitarian aid. You, you, you've got to let these people go. They refused at that particular time, still convinced we were smuggling some ammunition to the Serbs. So on the way back to my headquarters, I'm about to give the most difficult order in my life. I'm going to have to go back, and I'm going to have to brief the soldiers that you were going to put together a rescue mission. You were going to go into the primary high-rise location of Sarajevo, where there'll be plunging fire, and quite frankly, I don't think you'll be successful. I think most of you will be killed. But you're going to do it, because there's no way any of us are going to be able to look in the mirror if we let these guys be cooked, and they were being threatened to be burnt to death. I arrived back at my headquarters. Every one of the vehicles had been prepared. All the machine guns had been primed. Everyone had their kit. Orders had been given. And they were waiting for the word to go. Francophones. To rescue 26 Anglophones. That's my Canada. It's got... There are 2,000 more police in Toronto than there are infanteers in the Canadian Army. Defense. And I know this is a challenging audience on defense, but let me just give you, let me just give you a few figures. When I left the military in 1993, we were the number one contributor in the world to peace operations. Anybody that believes that we still have peacekeeping hasn't been paying attention for the last year. In the vast majority of cases, countries don't go to war anymore. Factions go to war. And when those bastards do bad things, they have to be stopped and frequently killed to keep them from doing it. Romeo Dallaire's case being a prime example. But while 800,000 are being slaughtered in Rwanda, let's not forget about the 2 million that are currently stacked up in southern Sudan. And maybe at least that many 900 million in the Congo, which we have totally and absolutely ignored. But we contributed with 1% of the world's population, 10% of the world's UN peace operators. We're 36 today, number 36. We have less than 300 soldiers on UN peace operations around the world. I'm proud to be an honorary chief of the Metro Toronto Police Services. There are 2,000 more police in Toronto than there are infanteers in the Canadian Army. And yet I hear people talking about massive military spending. My God, it'll destroy every social program in the country. March the Canadian Army into Maple Leaf Gardens, order it to sit down. There are 3,000 empty seats. That's your Canadian Army. For God's sake, it's the same people on the treadmill going back and forth, back and forth. And that's why pretty soon their spouses say, thank you very much. Be nice to see you once in a while. So when you, each of us, pays $243 for defense every year, 
and 460 is the European average. Forget about America, which is a special case where it's around six to 700. And somebody talks about throwing another billion or so in the direction of defense. It's to do what we do well. Your obligations abroad are somewhat equivalent to your blessings at home. We got a big frigging bill to pay. And what we have been spending more time doing is gazing at our navel, feeling sorry for herself. During the 1997 campaign, I was disappointed to the extreme when just about everybody that came up to me during the campaign started off with, I want you to do this for me. Not one person said, you know, there's a world out there and we're blessed to live where we do. And just maybe we should be getting off our butt and helping some other people who, through no fault of their own, are less fortunate than we are. I mean, what the heck is wrong with that? <laughs> Let me just explain to you, in closing, why I don't get complacent. Never again. I'm the most non-complacent guy you can imagine. I don't have post-traumatic stress or anything like that. I'm not suffering, but I do remember this incident every day when I start to sweat the small stuff. I come out of Sarajevo, do the briefings in New York. I arrive home. I'd left my family in the Glebe in Ottawa. And my time clock's all screwed up uh, by about six hours. So I get up early in the morning, I walk up Bank Street, and I purchase a copy of the Ottawa Citizen. I start to walk back to my apartment, house, sorry, and I look at the paper and I start to tear up, which is not something a grunt infantry general is supposed to do in public anyway. And I look at the paper and I can't figure out why I'm emotional. And then I realize the headline says, to GST or not to GST. And the subheadline is, it's going to rain tomorrow for the Calgary Stampeder Ottawa Rough Rider football game. Now, Two weeks earlier, in a bunker about this size, up to the second level, I'm on top of the second level, looking down through bulletproof glass, all buildings, government buildings in Yugoslavia, bulletproof glass, and I'm looking down at a dozen teenagers that we had brought over from one side of the conflict, from a holding camp, to our side, where the armored vehicles from the Bosnian government were to come and pick them up, take them back to what was left of their families in downtown Syria. Vehicles hadn't shown up in time. So through the machine gun ports in the bunker, a Jordanian, a Canadian, and a British female captain were handing chocolate bars from our ration packs to these teenagers. I'm looking at one girl in particular. Tall, blonde, blue-eyed, athletic, I'm bragging, looked very much like my daughter. And I'm focused on her. The mortar bomb went by me and landed in the middle of these teenagers. The girl I was looking at was decapitated, and her body was blown out in the middle of the street. Four, uh, four, and I hate to use the term, were literally vaporized. They disappeared. They were right beside the explosion. And the rest of these kids had limbs, one or two, hanging by shreds. Now, the three people that were handing the chocolate bars ran out to bring in the survivors. Really stupid thing to do. Because normally over there, what would happen, all sides would wait about 45 seconds and then fire the second bomb. That way you kill the rescuers. Second bomb wasn't fired. These victims were taken to our underground parking lot. I had begged the UN for a surgical team, and I've been told that I wouldn't get it because I didn't have mass casualties. Now I had them. So we had set up the stretchers over the drains in the second level of the underground parking lot with IV bags. And that's where our cleaning lady did the amputations. Our cleaning lady was a Bosnian Serb surgeon from the hospital in downtown Sarajevo, making $40 a week, sorry, a month when the war started. We paid her 60, wash our clothes, scrub the floors once a week. That's what happens when a country tears itself apart. The cleaning lady is a surgeon, the surgeon is a cleaning lady. Now, why do I tell you this story? It's not to be gruesome. It's not to try and convince you that this is some great war story. It's to tell you that a week after I was back in Canada, the GST was more important. What a luxury. What a frigging luxury that we live in a country where we can sweat stuff like a bloody tax or whatever and just flick through to the next channel. 
And my final comment is that there are a number of people in this country that don't forget. And I leave you with the thought of the Isfield family in northern Vancouver Island. Their son, Master Corporal Izzy Isfield, had served in the Gulf War, mine clearing, and he came to Croatia. And his job as an engineer was to clean the mines from tracks into fields so the farmers could get back in and raise their crops. He cleared a route. They went back the next day to finish the clearing, drove over the route they'd already cleared, premeditated, and he was blown to some mither reeds. Before he was killed, his mother would make small dolls, because when Izzy Isfield was out on patrol, and you can't tell the difference between a Serb, a Muslim, and a Croat. They're all Slavs, they all look the same, and he couldn't care less, like most Canadians couldn't care less what your religion or ethnic background is. He would have these dolls with him in his armor vehicle, and he'd lean over and hand one down to the kid. After he was killed, his mother, to this day, still makes the dolls. In fact, on this AIDS medication on its way to Africa, there are 2,000 of them, black dolls, used for packing rather than bubble paper, because the kids have nothing over there. They love these dolls. They're called Izzy dolls. I ask you, what country in the world produces a mother like that? And so I would say the next time, if we ever get there, we're voted the number one country in which to live. Don't apologize. Maybe they know something we don't. Thanks very much. Get the latest Idealist news, presenter information, and watch streaming video at www.ideacityonline.com.